Hey, what's going on, guys? And welcome back to another episode of Military Cash Flow. Today, you can see the whole setup is different, man. Why? Because we're right here in the shop of Stroop Knives, made by Chris Stroop and his family. Beautiful place, man. This guy has an amazing story. So as always, as I'm sure you guys are aware, he is a veteran. He spent 11 years in the military, has a whole wide breadth of experience. But ultimately, he decided to get out focus on real estate just to kind of set that platform for him to build this beautiful company right behind me. So without further ado, we're going to jump right to the interview. Today, we got a very special guest, Mr. Chris Stroop himself. And as you guys can see, the background is a little bit different. We got uh, some noise in the background. We got some tools in the background. It's because we're actually at his knife making shop, which is huge, right? Big surprise. So without further ado, Chris, would you please introduce yourself to the audience? Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Chris Stroop with Stroop Knives, also with Five Pillars Realty, with Mike and everybody else. It's awesome to be here with you. i um, been making knives since about 2017. We started out, it was my oldest son. He was probably six at the time. We decided to get into knife making. We started with a piece of steel and some files. <laughs> First knife we ever made. Um, it's not bad, it's floating around here somewhere. It took us forever, but me and my son just sat there with the file and we just sanded away back and forth over and over and over. We grabbed a piece of pallet wood that we had laying around for a handle and we glued that on. Made probably every mistake there is, but it was fun and we were hooked. So from there, we just started buying tools Little tools, we bought a grinder from Harbor Freight. I think it was $30 was our first purchase. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we, that, we love this. We're doing it. Nice. So nice. we've been making knives ever since then. And it's been awesome. We still do it as a family. The kids love being out here helping. My wife is involved. It's fun. Yeah. I'll tell you guys, Chris, Chris is a, he's got an amazing story. I mean, obviously, military guy, if you guys don't know. Yeah, as he mentioned, he's with Five Pillars for sure. Uh, him and his wife came and they've been selling some real estate. But the crazy thing is he's been doing this knife thing since 2017, apparently. I didn't even know that. And it started off with one. And just quick little teaser here. How many knives do you produce on average, I guess, in a month now? We're at about 125 right now, but we just moved into a new shop and we're working on our processes. We'll be at 200 by the end of summer. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> we talked about it a while back. Like that was his goal for 200. But you guys can see how just one knife with his, with his son randomly right in a shed somewhere, right? Now to over 120, 130, going to 200. It's insane. So uh, before we get into all of that, what was, uh, tell us a little bit, I guess, about your childhood growing up when it came to things about money and entrepreneurship. Was that a big part of your life growing up? Definitely not. Yeah. My mom and dad worked hard. My dad owned some businesses, I think, but he was kind of a dirtbag and they mm. failed. He almost went to jail for tax evasion, all, you know, the normal stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if that, if that wasn't the normal, I guess, for you, where do you think you started seeing some of your entrepreneurial, I don't know, like uh, uh, mannerisms really come from? For a long time, when I was in the military, I was bored when I wasn't working. So I wanted a hobby. So mm. I tried a lot of different things. We tried some woodworking. We tried Kydex sheaths. Yeah. And then my ex-wife told me I was stupid for wanting to make knives. Yeah. She's like, don't waste the $40 it's going to cost to buy some steel. Yeah. So I just like tinkering and doing things. And in the army, you learn how to be a leader. So that putting those two things together, the leadership and the making, yeah. sort of led to being in, having a successful business. Because now we have employees on payroll and managing all the parts and pieces. Nice. Yeah. It's, it's growing at an alarming rate, man. I'm super proud of what you built. It's been amazing just to kind of watch it all unfold. So uh, that's a, that's a good kind of segue. You, you grew up and you mentioned the military. Now, if you didn't have much of an entrepreneurial, I guess, inspiration in your childhood, did you have a, a large uh, influence to join the military at all? Or what was your deciding factor for you to say, you know what, I'm going to do this. I'm going to join the military. I was working construction. Before that, I was a manager at Lowe's. Nice. You just like to tinker on everything. Yeah. I did tinker on to do things. <laughs> I installed solar panels. I did construction on a commercial scale. We did residential. I nice. did a lot of different things and it was easy. Yeah. So I wanted a challenge. So I joined the army thinking it would be a challenge. Went through basic training and AIT. I was a commo guy. So I started out in Hawaii with 25th ID, did a year long deployment as a private and an E4. Mm -hmm. This isn't hard. 
Yeah. This is, it's not hard to be better than everybody else. So then I went to 160th Soar, and that was a little challenging. It was a lot more here, take, I was a combo guy. So here, take this combo equipment and go set it up wherever. Mm -hmm. But that got boring because, you know, you take the same combo equipment and you set it up somewhere different. Mm -hmm. So then I applied for a unit here at Fort Bragg in, with USASOC mm -hmm. and then loved it. It was a lot of freedom. It was, here's a problem, go solve it. So that problem solving and you're going to solve this problem. It doesn't really matter if you think you can, you're going to, because you can. So that mindset really helped be able to just solve all the problems that come up in real estate and the knife making business. Wow. Just that mindset of we're the best, we're going to solve this. Mm -hmm. It's doable. Go figure it out. You know, that's the one thing I love about the military. We talk about it all the time, but uh, people always think for whatever reason, civilians think that we have the best equipment, the best support, the best. And although we do have some very good equipment, a lot of times it's just whatever we have. You know, it may yeah. be outdated. It may be half broken. And it's not about the resources, it's about how resourceful we are with it. Uh, you know, it's a it's a can't fail, no fail type of a mindset when it comes to the military. And you're exactly right. It transitioned out uh, it, or helped us transition out. When you talk about uh, something which I think is pretty interesting is that you are always looking for more of a challenge. Like you said that uh, it was too easy. And so you wanted more of a challenge. And it was too easy. So you want more of a challenge. I think that's something that separates not only uh, entrepreneurs from, you know, non-entrepreneurs or employees, but it's what separates the good ones, you know, from the normal ones. Did you always have a competitive mindset, even as a kid? Like, did you play sports or did you have like siblings that you used to like fight with? Like, what was your mindset when it came to competition or just being better? I grew up skateboarding and playing drums. Nice. And it's not about being better than anybody else. I just wanted to be the best I can. Nice. So I always wanted to try the next thing. Like, oh, I jumped down this set of stairs, but there's a bigger one. We could do that next. Yeah. <laughs> so I just get bored and want something else to challenge me. I love it, man. And if you guys don't know this about this man, I'm going to brag on him a little bit. The way that his mentality is right there, I can tell that you instill that in your kids too. And so uh, his kids are the, are the best. Like a lot of them aren't, they're just jumping off of lunges. I was like, damn, <laughs> it's like, that's some scary <laughs> stuff, man. But it's, you know, just kind of challenge yourself and put yourself in that position to be better, uh, be a better version of you. I love that. I love that. So uh, you started doing more things in the military, started challenging yourself, pushing. And how long did you serve in the military? I did 11 years. 11 years. I did that's about the same amount of time that I did too. All right. So you're starting to do the military and same thing, like you just said, it's a reoccurring theme here. You start getting bored. You start wanting to challenge yourself more. Was that part of the reason why you decided to get out? Was it just you were looking for the next challenge or what was kind of like some of your deciding factors? I loved what I did. I would have stayed in forever if I nice. could, but I got hurt. Yeah. I hurt my right knee, it tore the cartilage in it, a big hole. We tried everything. Yeah. And then I was at a school and found out that I tore the meniscus in the left knee. Mm. So around that time was also when I got divorced. Mm. So it was a lot of big, huge changes, which was perfect because now I have my money. Yeah. yeah. Now it's mine. Now it's freedom. Yeah. Now I can do whatever I want. So I slowly started researching real estate. Mm -hmm. And then found you guys. Yeah. So, so tell us about your real estate journey then. What about real estate when, when you said you said started researching real estate? What were you exactly looking for in real estate? I had no idea. Yeah. I was just Googling stuff, looking on Zillow, found bigger pockets. Nice. Yeah. Which was perfect because then I could actually correlate what I was looking at on Zillow to real numbers and mm -hmm. things and how much money do I actually need. At this time, I had about $1,600 to my name. Yeah. Because I moved out of my house with a bag of dirty clothes out of the washing machine. So they were dirty and wet. Yeah. <laughs> and I was living on a friend's couch. And it was all good things, you know? Yeah. Big changes, pain. Yeah. <laughs> but we made it all work. But I wanted something better. Mm -hmm. I knew that I was making a decent living through the army, but we had nothing to show for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I wanted something to pass on to my kids. Mm -hmm. Go, I make, I don't know, whatever dollars you make as an E7 in the army. Mm -hmm but I wanted something to be able to pass to the kids and have them manage it and take over if they wanted to. They liked that. I love that. Yeah. I, I think what, with the military specifically, we get 10, we tend to get comfortable, right? Because we see this paycheck coming in and it comes in every first and the 15th, like clockwork, right? It doesn't miss. It doesn't matter if you're on vacation for 30 days or whatever, you have that paycheck come in and it's a, it's a comfortable living. But as you mentioned, typically it's not enough to put somewhere else to build something. Like you don't ever have anything to show for it. 
Uh, you might have a nice car or a functioning car, right? You might have a nice house, maybe, or a functioning house, but you don't have anything. So I love how you were looking uh, into something else. And again, it was bigger than you. It wasn't for you. It was for your kids. Um, and so then you found real estate and you found uh, Five Pillars. And tell us a little bit about your journey as far as as soon as you kind of jump both feet in with, with real estate, what did it look like as both an agent and an investor? Because he's both, guys. He's both agent and investor. What did that kind of look like for you? So to get started, I did the internship mm -hmm. through SOCOM. I forget the name of the program. Mm -hmm. but it's CSP or whatever. That's for the military. But yeah, yeah. yeah, I did an internship for the last nine months of my enlistment, mm -hmm. which was perfect because I was able to get my real estate license and start learning what real estate was. Yep. So in that time, I got to learn real estate, get the whole process down. So by the time I finally got out med board, I was able to be an agent and mm -hmm. be sustaining on my own at that point. Yeah. So we started out selling some houses, mostly to investors. My first transaction was to one of my really good friends. He's actually a knife maker too, which nice. is perfect. That's how, <laughs> nice. that's how I got my first lead was talking to him about knives. Nice, <laughs> hey, nice. I'm going to school to be a real estate agent. Let's do this. So I got to practice with a friend. It was mm. perfect. So the real estate, all the money we made from it, we put into our own investment properties. Mm. So by working with investor clients, I was able to learn how to be an investor by helping them through it. So I met a couple other agents through Five Pillars, Camille and Mark, mm -hmm. and we partnered on our first three or four or so deals together. And then we brought a contractor into our partnership also nice. because our biggest hole was that contractors suck yep. or they're slow or they're hard to get a hold of or we just don't trust them. So we found one that we really liked and we just brought them into our partnership. Nice. Smart. That's, that's going back to that problem solving, right? You got a problem and you fix it. You got a hole. Hey. An easy solution is instead of uh, finding somebody that we have to pay extra, why don't we just bring them in on the equity piece and save money? That's actually a very intelligent. He also mentioned uh, Camille and Mark. Shout out to them, too. You guys have seen Mark Horton on the podcast with Horton State Rentals. Again, these guys are out here building businesses, right, as they're investing and as they're selling. I love it. Um, and the last little piece there you said was that uh, you started off with a friend as essentially your first deal, and you learn how to invest by helping other clients do it. Guys, you'll be surprised at how much business is where's it at is right here how much business is in your phone right just because of the relationships that you've already built just having those kind of conversations and networking it's it's uh, tremendous so um you started off with that client and you started buying your first couple of properties let me ask you how many properties did you acquire or what did it kind of look like for your first year of focused real estate i would say we're probably at our first year right now of okay. actively investing we have Five short-term rentals mm -hmm. and a duplex nice. at this point. And most of our money we've been able to get back out. Yeah, Four of them are active on Airbnb right now. Probably about a 90% occupancy rate. Just nice. doing really well. Nice. And all the money goes right back into the business. That way we can keep rolling. Nice. And when you say most of your money back out, you're talking about something like a cash out refi or a yep. burr strategy, right? Burr strategy, yep. Beautiful. Right yeah. now we're taking a pause of buying because our books are a little scattered. Yep. And we're just getting everything tight and building our systems better, getting everybody on the same page yep. because we're all also running other businesses. Exactly. Sometimes we've got to reel it in. And <laughs> exactly. But we didn't buy one property. We bought three for our first one. Yeah. We just went in like we have the money. Just go. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. And that, that's a perfect example, guys, where, I mean, you heard it straight from his mouth, right? Acquisition, crazy, right? Bought three on his first one and came around with the duplex. Now they're at five uh, with Five of them being short-term, correct? Five short-terms yeah. and a duplex. And a duplex. So seven units, right? In 12 months. First off, that's impressive within its own right. So kudos to that and congratulations on that. But even then he said, hey, we got to pull it back a little bit, right? Focus on the finance and stabilize it, so then go out and then buy more and more and more. So it can be done, guys. It can be done when you build the right team. And I love that story. Now, you went from military and doing, making knives. You come in, you did some real estate to really kind of, uh, I guess, give you a platform of capital with some sales and now you got some rentals and then all of a sudden somewhere in there the knife business just started taking off so what did that look like how did that knife business kind of uh start to grow from just that one knife to where you're at now with 120 a month so i guess during my military time i started building up my skills in my shop here mm -hmm. <laughs> all the money we made selling knives went right back into equipment and nice. materials and nice knowledge and things so because of that it was rolling. We were doing maybe 20 knives a month when we got out, maybe 30 at the most. We were still learning, making our processes better. So we got into real estate and we started having money. That way we could take the risk and COVID happened. So the real estate market got really weird. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. There wasn't a lot of deals for investors. It was hard to leave the house. Yep. We're like, man, we have this knife business and we can sell every single knife we make instantly. Yep. So why don't we take the risk and build the knife business now? Because we can. Mm -hmm. We have the money flowing in from other places that there's not a lot of risk. I know we can pay our bills. So mm -hmm. let's just build this business. I love it. So we still put most of our money from the knife business back into the knife business right. by expanding. We got the CNC machine. We're saving up for another CNC machine. That way we can systematize our things. Nice. Produce more with the same amount of people. Yep. And that way we can give attention to the tasks that are hard yep. and have machines do the easier things that I don't want to do. Speaking of, almost like it, that's out of a, a book somewhere, almost like it's in a textbook somewhere, because that's exactly right, man. I love your thought process behind systematizing it because that's that's what um, you know effective businesses do, right? That's how they scale. They find those easy tasks that they can systematize as quickly as they can, and the and the things that give you your unique touch, your customization. Yeah, you get some human hands on it and you keep going. So I love that. Now um, it started to scale, and, I, and you mentioned how COVID pretty much changed the landscape for a lot of different businesses, a lot of different people. Um, when it comes to investment sales and things of that nature, you found an opportunity to just kind of close yourself indoors and focus on knives. When you were focusing on knives, was it the machinery that you purchased that really allowed you to start producing more? Or was it just you being hyper-focused about developing maybe the systems themselves or hiring the right people? What was that, that first step that kind of set you over? The biggest step was systematizing everything. Gotcha. You guys can't really see the shop, but every space in here has a purpose. Yeah. So there's one table just for gluing handles on. There's mm -hmm. a whole corner just for pressing Kydex sheets and mm -hmm. it goes in order. So the press is for the heat and then the Kydex press. Mm -hmm. Then there's a spot to mark all the holes and then there's the drill presses yeah. and then the eyelet presses. So everything flows in order. We spent a lot of time designing the layout. And then more importantly is the people. Yeah. We have Sarah and Ian and then Rex. Mm -hmm. So each person has their specialties now. I'm taking a lot of time to train them mm -hmm. and they care about our business because we're a family here. Mm -hmm. So they're invested also, and they want to see us succeed. And it's just a lot of fun. We hang out in the shop and make knives all day. And I, I get it. to pay people to, work, yeah. to make knives for me. It's awesome. I love it, man. And, and uh, you guys can't see the shop. And I'll try to get some footage of the shop so you guys can get a feel for it. But uh, when I first seen uh, Chris build out his first original shop, it was in his garage of the last house. And so it was uh, still effective, still very effective, but it was a lot tighter space, right? And then now that he's opened up the new shop, I mean, it, it's a nice little layout. You can definitely tell that three or four bodies can fit in here at one time comfortably, right? And get some work done. And the systematizing, spending uh, time designing the layout reminds me a lot of the McDonald's story. And I don't know if you guys ever seen the movie, uh, The Founder, but it talks about how the McDonald's brothers literally would draw out the layout on a blacktop in chalk and literally just go and rehearse to make sure that it was the most effective layout. And that's kind of like, what's kind of going on here, right? As far as it's streamlining and almost like an assembly line. So I love that. And then uh, you said that uh, I wanted to highlight the, and I'm going to call it financial freedom, but the simple fact that once income streams started coming in, you now had the flexibility to say, hey, let me put a little bit more effort into knife making. And I think that's one thing that we miss when we speak about financial freedom and side hustles and things of that nature. Understanding that once we go out there and do, do whatever the task is. Doesn't mean that that has to be our all day, every day, balls to the wall type of task. It's just to give us enough breathing room to then focus on the things that we really have fun with, right? And it sounds like you are having a blast making these knives. For right? sure. So I, I love that. So what do you see coming next when it comes to the, to the knife industry? Where do you see this company growing? Stroop Knives, by the way, if y'all can't see that. Yeah. Where do you <laughs> see uh, Stroop Knives going from here? Right now we're working on getting into more retailers. We're in 13 retailers. We're talking mm, with a big nice. retailer right now that has six giant retail stores nice. uh, all over North Carolina. So that would be a huge for us. And we're working on getting our manufacturing techniques nailed down to be able to provide knives for all these places. Nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a little scary, but like Ruben says, commit now, figure it out later. Damn right. Shout out to Ruben <laughs> Garcia, man. Absolutely. Commit now, figure it out later. I love that. And so uh, do you see yourself uh, potentially needing more employees and maybe growing even out of the shop eventually? We have a lot of room for expansion here. Mm -hmm. We can almost double our shops or more than double our shop space here, nice. probably triple it. Nice. So I think it's going to be a long time till we outgrow this place yeah. if ever. Right now we're focusing on training our two main employees and getting Rex here more often and yeah. having him. He sets up our CNC machines and does a lot of things to systematize stuff for us. So 
something I'm not that good at is CNC. So I hired somebody. Yep. Yep. And we're really just focusing on training and creating everything to maximize what we have here before we do more with more people. Absolutely. But I think before we hire somebody else, we're going to buy that CNC mill because mm-hmm. that'll eliminate probably 30 or 40 minutes of every knife. Yeah. Oh, God, that would be a lot. Yeah. How, so on that note, then, how long does it take right now just in general to p- produce one knife? When we were still in the two-car garage, we timed it, and it was 90 minutes. 90 minutes. We should be a lot more efficient here. Okay. So we can do larger batches, and we can be more deliberate about how we do everything because mm-hmm. we have the space for it. But I haven't timed it. I would guess it's around 70 minutes, maybe. Okay. And then you're thinking with that, with that CNC mill, you should be able to reduce that from 70 to potentially 40 or even 30? Yep. Per knife. That's the plan. That is insane. That means three knives essentially in the time that it took you to produce one in the other two cars. Yeah. So that would change the, the landscape for sure. Two years ago, it took us three and a half hours to make a knife. Whoa. All right. So what would you what would you credit to uh the I guess the, the mass improvement of efficiency? What what is the biggest impact of that? Commit to doing something a hundred times. We got an order for a hundred knives. Nice. The same exact knife. Nice. Most boring thing in the world. Yep. So you're either going to focus and make it better or it's going to take you seven years. God, I love it. So we focused on perfecting every little thing we did. Yeah. And not only does it take less time, our knives are higher quality because we've dug into every single process mm-hmm. and everything is done the same way and to a T. I love so it. we always focus on making a better knife and then faster. Yes. But as long as the knife is better, then we can work on making it faster. That's exactly right. I, if you guys remember the quote, and I'm going to butcher this, but Bruce Lee said something along the lines of, don't fear the man who practices a thousand kicks. Fear the man who practices one kick a thousand times. It's the same thing. Like you master that art until you just, you know how to move through it so smoothly. And uh, I, I, I preach this all the time when it comes to real estate for all the real estate listeners. When you, come, when you want to feel comfortable and, and be efficient and expedient at running numbers or coming up with solutions, you got to practice it. You got to deal analyze. You have to you know, go through the motions and you did the same thing with the knives and boom, went from literally three hours to now 70 minutes, give or take, and hopefully here even shorter than that. Man. I love it. So for all the, the uh, veterans out there or active duty service members who are looking to, to potentially start their own business, maybe it's knives, maybe it's real estate. What is the one piece of advice that you can give them to help them get started? The one piece of advice I would give is be hyper-focused on the one thing that you want to do. Mm-hmm. It's easy to get overwhelmed when I was Starting real estate, we were doing knives and real estate, getting out of the army, getting divorced, mm-hmm. a million things at once. But the second that I hyper focused on any one thing, either our real estate partnership, for a yeah. while I just mostly stopped everything I was doing to focus on getting that started. Yes. So we went from zero properties to three in no time. Nice. We went from not knowing how to sell houses to ha- I have 15 houses under contract. Yes. So pick one thing and be really good at it. It doesn't mean you have to stay in that one thing, but pick one thing, get really good systematize it and then you can move on to the next thing but you're never going to be good at a million things if you do them all at once i love that that's so true guys there's so many people who come out and they say hey how do i how do i get in real estate and start investing and still keep my primary job and start a crawl space inspection company and it's like whoa guys slow it down get one thing like chris is saying get damn good at it make your money there and then take that money, put it into something else, right? That produces passive money. And then you focus on your passion or whatever it is that you have fun with or, or, or your next venture, right? I love that. And that's, I, I, it's just, it's true, but it's not stated enough. So, okay. Now everybody is ready to focus on one thing. And you know what? That one thing is getting in contact with you. <laughs> so what's the best way for people to reach out to you? The best way is through our Instagram page, Stroop Knives, S-T-R-O-U-P, mm-hmm. Knives. We also have a website. We do a big drop every other Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Nice. And we have a Facebook page and our email is stroopknives at Mm gmail.com. But the best way is to follow our Instagram page because it's got links to all of our things on there. And you can follow us and watch us build stuff together and have fun. Perfect. And you guys already know we're going to have all that information down in the show notes. So, uh, Chris, man, I greatly appreciate you uh, coming out and inviting me into this beautiful workshop and Taking some time out, man, to talk to these guys. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was awesome. Absolutely, man.